You want to see the galaxy while discovering new exotic life, then die in the most beautiful hellscape imaginable? Uh-uh. Then Helldivers 2 may be for you. It features brutal, always on friendly fire, and above average reliance on your teammates, and my personal favorite, a steaming hot cup of liberty. Mmm. For my tongue. Helldivers 2 is not for everyone, and instead was aimed at a very specific group of maniacs that like to dive head first. But not really into hell, it's more of a concept, although there's a planet called Hellmire, and it does have fire tornadoes and monsters that come out of glowing holes, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty much. The basics of Helldivers 2 is you and three complete strangers, or friends, I guess, if you want to brag, fly face first into planets infested with either big bugs or beep boops. You have two options to begin playing with a team of silly billies and friendly fire freddies from your super destroyer ship. Attempt to join a match already in progress. Oh. Sorry, let me just, whoop, sorry, let me just, uh, whoop. or choose to host a game and prepare to wait for your team to lock it in. Once formed successfully, the team will then work together to decide where to drop. Here. This is important as with any relationship, how it starts will determine how it ends. Successfully with cooperation, or not that way, you want to land relatively close to your first objective, but not so close that you end up with a hot landing. The moment your team lands, they'll begin to order in a cluster of same-day delivery support options, and if there's time, hit that like and subscribe button. Unless, of course, you're not a freedom-loving patriot. Then, armed with far more firepower than they can handle, the team will either work together or die together before attempting to escape with their resources and hopefully, their lives. Each planet has its own biome, complete with movement affecting terrain, whether that might reduce visibility or perhaps jellyfish? They may also come with planetary effects like high heat which causes a faster drain on stamina, or meteor showers which cause a faster drain of pee, -pee in my uniform. You may have noticed the map is not always out, making navigation at times difficult and at always very fun. You'll have to pull up the map manually in order to discover where enemies have been detected or where your objectives are. This map can also be used to mark areas for non-verbal communication or to find out where your squad mates have wandered off to. I have never been a fan of always out mini maps and this is a great example why. They're distracting, take up too much of the screen, and you can actually design the game around not having them. Something you'll discover immediately as a new recruit, as you'll actually have to navigate to the tutorial where you'll learn just how unforgiving this game can be. As well as how important and cool diving is, the distinct lack of a jump button that causes you to climb things you may not want to climb, and of course, the impeccably well-designed game feel. Something that really stands out to me is the difference between where you look and where your weapon actually aims. Barring what is usually reserved for vehicle simulators, this system is the core, what the game actually feels like. Your character doesn't just turn as fast as your camera, and different weapons affect the handling of this perfect little circle. Oh, this one's a triangle. Smaller weapons have tighter handling, while larger weapons tighten Mitch's pants. It's so intuitive, in fact, I'm surprised it wasn't already the gold standard of third-person shooters. It adds so much to the game's visceral feel, and just gives every weapon their own rhythm. This game is also a semi-first-person game, as you can aim and even reload from this perspective, but for some reason can't play the whole game this way. This is quite a nice quality-of-life feature, as often the aiming reticle ends up close to your character's head, and bullets actually come out of your weapon, not the camera as most games do. You can even choose to remember this mode on specific weapons, allowing you to round out your setup for a variety of engagement distances and quite comfortably fire from the hip Gears of War style. On launch, Helldivers 2 features two very distinct enemy factions, and a suspicious empty galaxy for future ones. You never know what else could be out there. The first and most recognizable are the Terminate, giant bugs that slow you with acid or bowl you over while continuing to pursue you without a head. The second being the Automatons, with their terrifying sprinting robots, chainsaws for arms, and heavy units that have a habit of exploding after you defeat them. Oh, did I say heavy units? It's not just the heavy units. <laughs> Something shared between the two is the nightmares they give me. Yeah. 
but also weak points indicated by red hit markers. This is quite an important thing to get used to as you will waste a lot of your very limited ammo on parts that deflect your fire. For many enemies it's the head, but for others it's the head. With rockets? Most enemies are toughest on their front, which really promotes a team with good positioning. And don't think that squishy squishy tushy is a weak point if you aren't firing explosives. These exposed bits are highly resistant to small arms fire. Instead, take a chunk of that armor off first and then go to town. But probably not with that pistol, I don't know, I'm not really crazy about that. Pistol. Weapon balancing is simple and beautiful, like your father. But gets me chuffed like your mother, kinda like the magazine management system. You know that thing in video games where you can just reload whenever you want and you don't waste any rounds? <laughs> Cell virus too, baby! Reloading too early will waste any rounds left on that bad boy, and if you do get to the end, it takes longer to reload and doesn't do it automatically. This adds a huge level of balance not normally found in most shooters. Automatic weapons work great when surrounded by vicious people eaters, while certain weapons have lower fire rates but reload individual shells. So you can reload between every kill and never waste any rounds left in the magazine, giving me an excellent opportunity to use my pump tactic. remembered for their... Support weapons are not part of your loadout and are highly valuable to people that value success. The machine gun thunk thunks enemies to bits but requires you to take a knee during reload, while the stalwart does less damage with more bullets as you perform a running reload. And the heavy machine gun with its widow baby magazine hits harder than a fully loaded F-250 extended cap. cap. The arc thrower is shockingly good, at team killing, the flamethrower is straight fire for real for real. And the railgun features an unsafe mode. Yeah, I'd say so. Oh, hold on, sorry, the instructions say the unsafe part isn't the front. In the category of explosives, the grenade launcher slaps, and the recoilless rifle feels amazing, especially when taking down dropships in just one hit. But neither hold a military-grade candle to the expendable anti-tank. At first I thought, why would I choose a single-use rocket when I could have multiple, until I did something more important than blowing things up? Math. Each drop contains two single-use rockets, in a perfect world of which the citizens of Super Earth reside. That means you can call down 68 rockets in a 40-minute mission. If all four of you run it, that is a potential of 270 shoulder-fired anti-armor rockets that you can share that still allows you to run a backpack and one-shot chargers in the face. Oh, what's that? I died and dropped one? Barely, Barely an inconvenience. inconvenience. I've got another two on the way right now. My recommendation is don't be stingy, Mark. Those targets. If we have to, we gonna use your booty. But aim for the head jeans and you'll never have to ask, is he down? Keep them high and tight, mommies, and please stop feathering your teammates with the back blast. Y'all know to follow Proto. It's also important to use stratagems, which are support options from the spirit in the sky. You know the only thing better than an orbital laser? Two airstrikes, support weapons, airstrikes, automatic devices, and even airstrikes can be called in using a specific D-pad input. And a lot of care went into balancing how complicated and appropriate each of these are. The jump pack is all ups and downs, while big boomies like the hell bomb show which direction little Susie's gonna go when it's armed. My personal favorite is the recoilless rifle, which shows the down arrow for the knee you have to take to reload it, followed by an even mix of forward and backward arrows, as that's how it achieves force parity. I don't know if that's the right expression, but it sounds really cool. The most important ones you should learn off by heart, like supplies, something you'll need to call in frequently and can even time to take out larger enemies. There's also reinforcements, which respawns your squad mates by doing the universal symbol for healing, and then up, I guess. Which brings me to the best and worst thing about this game, your squad. Survival is dependent on whether you stick together and support each other, or stick together and blow each other up. Oops. Friendly fire is always on, and this includes automated devices like drones and turrets. But no device will PK your ass quite as hard as one of your teammates' explosives. Hey, did you arm the- How they gave his own show to Tad Postal. And in a given second he could go mad postal. Stay waved in that power band space cannon. And had the nerve to jump in the face. A race ban and pumped out. Like you also need each other for various objectives, like tuning a satellite without knowing where as it's shown on another terminal, or simply by pushing a button at the same time. Oh hey guys, I thought you were someone else. I love that you actually have to operate these terminals instead of hitting a button. It adds a lot of tension, especially when you know your squad mate is watching over your shoulder. 
So you're gonna push that button or... As an absolute, your teammates will die and how you choose to bring them back will determine whether you have to do it again. Some people think you should reinforce right into a mob of enemies. Some people say you should wait for an appropriate moment. Some people are squirrel handed. Gregor is a weird name. If the team has reinforcements left and everyone dies, you don't lose the game. Instead, the whole team spawns in at once, making for a stronger redeploy. This means that reinforcing at all costs is a pointless venture, and you should instead focus on not dying first. Crazy, I know. Although it is true that friendlies help you avoid dying, so maybe don't just not Reinforce. Also, a reinforcing teammate is basically a missile that can kill bile titans. If and when the squad appears to be losing, some people will leave. And this doesn't seem like a good thing, but I promise you, it is. This is because for the most part, your actions will dictate how many enemies you'll have to fight. Outside of defense missions and activating objectives, enemies don't just spawn. Instead, enemies can be called in by smaller scout units, spawn in from holes or factories, or just be found roaming around looking for fresh meat. <laughs> and trust me, you do not want to know what they need the meat for. It is possible, though quite difficult, to stop these reinforcements, easier to take out spawn points with grenades, and often vital to avoid these patrols. Who knows, they might just run into mines they placed. You do not need to engage every enemy, and the game has a really cool, if kind of hidden, stealth system. And you won't discover any of this with a team of trigger-happy buttheads. So my advice, if you really want to get to know this game on your own, not knocking the music, but turn it off and play solo, as this will really show off the subtlety you're missing with a full squad. Solo and duo play completely changed my view on this game, and now I'm really happy to see you go. Dingus that blew me up 10 times? Ooh, but he did leave me this. <laughs> Difficulty is a big part of the experience, with each level increasing the amount and size of the buck kicking you'll be receiving and the reward for succeeding. Unlike a lot of games, enemy and player health are not touched as difficulty rises. Instead, it increases the amount and type of enemies, creating a more intense experience. What a low difficulty calls a mission is actually just an enemy in higher ones. This means that every level matters, and most importantly, the game feel is preserved. As a new player, you'll have to work your way up the ladder, but those last rungs are so so worth it. I have never had so much fun losing in a video game. But if you're having issues with any of these difficulties, I've got a strat for you. I call it Roof Strat. It's not perfect, but it beats being down on the ground with the rest of the plebs. But watch out as drop pods, airstrikes, and chargers can pull the roof right out from under ya. From under ya no It's for this reason that I recommend a close second to Roof Strat. Rock Strat. The issue here is that rocks aren't always as easy to climb, and bugs can still get you down to their buddies and gobble you up. Nom, 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 nom. But there is another strategy that tops everything we've covered so far. If you're ever overwhelmed, I've got one last piece of advice. Run. It is quite normal for me to be way past playing a game by the time I'm ready to release a video on it, but I am still completely enthralled by this experience. Personally, I've been a big fan of Arrowhead Studios since 2015, and believe they've always been knocking it out of the park, just at a sport people were not willing to watch. No, Magic, I came out in 20... 2011? In an industry attempting to milk every dollar out of a trash game intended for the widest audience possible. Helldivers 2 is an extraordinary example of the success you can have with a laser beam focus on what your product will be and who it will be four. But the commitment to a bold, beautiful, and often brutal balance paid off a little more than they might have expected. With an overwhelming amount of players flooding the servers at launch, leading to the CEO of Arrowhead recommending people don't buy the game until they can get the server situation worked out. They aimed for the moon and landed directly on the sun. Personally, I would have tried landing at night, but they fixed the issues for the most part, and ever since I've been adding cool stuff, slick stuff, neat stuff. And every time they do, I think, oh, this is gonna be overpowered. The balance is out the window every- Oh, they also have a great attitude towards monetization and live service. Words that have become ick and totally mid. But on God fan, the acquisitions page finna be lit. No cap, the stats be buffing and the drip be bussin'. Helldivers 2 is among the most legendary co-op shooters of all time. It has surprised the world with an attitude and final execution that made me go, Oh, it's not me, it's the kids who are out of touch. Deliberate, balanced game design, a reasonable price, and satirical game writing 
that isn't in your face about its message. Helldivers 2 asks many questions of its player base, including is a bigger magazine worth a longer reload? Is more armor worth less movement? What does eagle sweat taste like? And most importantly, is it better to serve in heaven? Or better to reign in hell? Meyer. Since when the way out secluded Zorak, way back he used to rub his thorax and borax. Climbing, running, jumping, misjudging distance and face planting six stories down. It's actually fun.